Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. I am in the Netherlands uh, in the Space Expo Center outside of ESA's STEC. There's a decent amount of spaceflight hardware, and what's fun for me is these are engines I don't know anything about. Sorry, ESA, and sorry, Ariane Space. I really actually don't know almost anything about those engines, I've studied uh, Soviet rocket engines, I've studied US engines, but I know literally almost nothing about these particular engines. So that's why after the fact, I'll study up on them and I'll talk to experts like the French space guy, and then I'll put up little captions about what I have right and wrong on screen here. And then I'll make some corrections along the way so that I don't just spread inf misinformation doing this fun little experiment. Okay, this is from the Ariane 5. It's the Vulcan engine. Is it a Vulcan like something number? I don't even know. Is it just Vulcan? I think it's Vulcan as a scheme. Vulcan? Yeah. See, this is, this, is, this is what's fun for me is I don't know. I really have not studied this rocket at all. So the only thing that I do know is that it's Hydrolox based. It is kind of a sustainer engine. So let's go through this engine together. I'm going to get stuff wrong. I'm going to be speculating. And this is just going to be a fun, like, watch. It. I'll, I'll try to explain the things that I'm thinking about and, and observing. And uh, I'm excited for you guys to help correct me in the comments because I'm, I know I'm going to get stuff wrong, and that's the fun of this. It's, so don't take it for uh, don't take it for every word that I say. But the first thing I notice, see the spirals here, spiral round regenerative cooling. This is something actually that the Merlin um, one seeded when SpaceX switched from an ablatively cooled nozzle. Uh, the the one C was their first regen channeled uh, nozzle, which had spiral. The idea is that if you have a, a, a kind of a conical shaped nozzle, the and you have tubes, let's say you have, let's just make up a number, let's say you have 100 tubes going around a nozzle that gets bigger. The tube at the, the, because of the area at the top is smaller, the tube has to get skinnier. And as it gets down towards the bottom, the tube has to get wider. And the problem is, you actually, this is the hottest part of the engine. So you actually want the most fuel flowing through this area too. And you don't need as much down at the bottom because it doesn't get as hot. So spiral winding allows you to keep the same, relatively the same um, size piping and you just literally do a basket wind and you just whoop, 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 whoop. And that way it just, you don't even almost have to consider the, the diameter of each individual tube because it, it makes up for it by, by winding. So that's what that is. I'm pretty sure these are just braces that are to help keep it in place. I don't think that's part of the regen. You do see that there's, some wiring likely to, I don't know if that's a, a heat wire or, or it's what? I believe those are strain gauges. Strain gauges, interesting. Strain gauges. So by the way, we have some of our teammates here. Everyone say hi. hi. And uh, so uh, it's gonna be fun because we'll probably be tossing around some ideas as well. Um, so yeah, Hydrolox engines. So let's see if we can at least figure out the difference between the hydrogen pump and the oxygen pump. Normally an oxygen pump is gonna be tiny, small tube, very small. That already looks like, well, unless, see, then you gotta look, it's, it's actually a dual shaft engine, so it has two gas generators. And we know they're gas generators because the exhaust of the gas generator is simply dumped overboard. It's not, re, it's not closed cycle, it's an open cycle. Hydrolox engine, you can tell by the two gas generators. Let's see here if we can figure out which one is hydrogen and which one is oxygen. Okay, so out of the actual pump, that's the pump there. That is not an inlet for the gas generator. It's gonna be on top. Where's the top of this one? It is that guy up there. So that tube, and actually the fact that this has a thermal jacket on it likely means this is the hydrogen. This is the hydrogen. Yep, perfect. I was, yep, I was gonna say, and the fact that it has a, a thermal blanket on it would make sense for hydrogen too. So it's bigger, has a thermal, to make sure it doesn't all boil off. And so that goes into here. So the manifold here, Right there, that's the hydrogen's gonna go in there. The oxygen appears to go into the top. What's it doing up there? I wish we could see this a little bit better. Oh, 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 we're not even at the throat. This isn't even the throat here. This is the bottom of the combustion chamber. The throat's way up in there. Like, I don't know if you can see this flow. Sorry, I knocked your camera. But the, um, the throat's up in there. So this is all part of just the regen channels is flowing hydrogen through there, through the walls going back up, and it's gonna make its way up towards the top. Now, meanwhile, the oxygen pump goes up to the top, trying to figure this out still, trying to figure out what this is. This might actually just be a gas generator right here. There might only be a single 
gas generator, but divide it out to two turbines. Because you can do that. You can just have a, you just need something to literally, oh, what does that say? I don't know, a bunch of stuff in French. <laughs> so that's not gonna help me. But if that's, that's what it appears to be, is that this is a, a separate gas generator that is up there, flows down through a manifold, gets split out between the two turbines. So there's a turbine here and a turbine there. The hydrogen turbine is likely going to consume much more power than the oxygen turbine. You'd think this would actually need a much thicker pipe due to those power demands. It is a little bit, it's a little bigger. Then, uh, let's see. Like I said, again, guys, I, I'm excited for the comments on this one because I know I'm going to be getting things wrong and someone out there knows this engine like you wouldn't believe. And I'm sitting here just simply observing it, just trying to make guesses based on what I see. Let's see here. Sorry, Flo, it's getting pretty tight back in here. You have part of the gimbal mount here, so that's where it mount to the space, uh, the, the actual gimbal mount up there, but then the actuators to, to do the steering would connect right there. Hmm. What else can we observe? What else is... Hmm, that goes out after, what is that? Now that I can't get a handle on myself. And this, what would this be for? Oh, this could be part of a heat exchanger or something to go back if they did autogenous pressurization of the, of the tanks. You might have a heat exchanger through part of this gas generator, but I don't know if that's the case. This is again thermally jacketed. So hydrogen at some point is flowing. Why would it go there? I have no, unless it's a heat exchanger. That very well might be part of a, a, a heat exchanger loop through here. Most likely some kind of purge lines down here for startup. And those are on both, no, those are only on that side. What's this guy here, another big, oh, there is a purge line down here, some kind of something. Man, again, I'm excited just to just kind of read up on this engine now and, and see what I can actually learn just by properly studying it instead of just looking at it. Um, there's a few more things that I wanted to point out too. It looks like they have some uh, spot welds over here to fill in where it must have uh, burnt through at some point for some reason. So this, this obviously wouldn't probably be flight worthy, which is why it's here. Um, yeah, so that's really mostly, oh, this would, this would probably be just the main fuel valve, by the way. So remember, if you have seen our how to start a rocket engine, we talk about um, thermally conditioning the pumps. So what they would do is normally you'd sit, and especially with, with hydrogen, with the hydrogen system, you really gotta soak those pumps in, in liquid hydrogen. So what you do is you actually literally fill the pumps, uh, you open up the main valves of the tanks or the pre-valves of the tanks, you pour in liquid hydrogen, you fill that whole pump system down to here and then you close it off right here. And what that does is it allows the pumps and the bearing inside that shaft for the, the turbo pump to cool down to cryogenic temperatures. Um, now with liquid oxygen, there's probably a main oxidizer valve too. It might be the thing on the very top. So they would also have to soak the turbo pump in uh, and liquid oxygen to cool that down to operating temperatures too. Um, now, the, yeah, a fun little context thing here. I did want to point out the engine here that we're seeing is, is what's right here on the bottom of the Ariane 5. And it's known as a sustainer engine because if you notice there's some large solid rocket boosters here next to it. I mean, these are, these are massive solid rocket boosters. They're very similar in thrust output to the space shuttle. They're, they're huge solid rocket boosters. Those are what physically lifted off the ground because this engine alone is not nearly powerful enough to lift the large center core of the Ariane 5. So the, the, the booster engines quite literally lift the center core off the ground. Uh, and the whole time the center core engine is running though, it does light on the ground and then is a sustainer engine and it runs almost, you know, it burns for a long time, similar to how the space shuttle would light solid rocket boosters and then run the RS-25s basically up until orbit. It's a similar thing. They, it doesn't quite get up to, uh, to the same velocity as, 
as the space shuttle because it still has a, a second stage, an upper stage on top. So uh, just for perspective though, that's uh, kind of cool to be able to see that there. But yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much all I can point out here that I know and can figure out just by looking at it. Because man, sometimes you look at a rocket engine like this and you just see how many pipes and little things here and there. And again, I don't know anything about this engine. So um, this, this might not, maybe later on they got a little bit fewer, you know, there's still a bunch of tap offs. This could have been a developmental engine of some kind. Um, because it's got those strain gauges, it almost certainly is a development. Right, strain gauges, development engine. And this actually says mock-up only, I just realized, right here. Mock-up only. Well, that's a high fidelity mock-up. For them to machine and, and produce this just for mock-up, unless it's just literally something that they threw away, you know, like, hey, this isn't good enough. Save this for a, a mock-up, but it sure looks <laughs> like it has all of the, the bellows and everything. And there's one more thing too that I wanted to point out too. So if this is the main fuel valve here, notice there's a little pipe right here. Pretty sure this is the pipe that feeds the gas generator of its fuel because it goes right up, snakes up, and goes right into the top of the gas generator. So that's, um, there's actually a chance that with the valve motion that that would actually get fuel first. That's actually how a lot of, like the RS-25, when the valve would move a certain, past a certain point, it would first feed, you know, a pipe until it, after a certain point when it cracks open, then it feeds the rest of the system. There is a chance that that is actually, uh, you know, would get fuel before anything else just to start feeding the gas generator right away. So I'm pretty sure that's the gas generator line. But yeah, that's, uh, again, that's an engine that I know almost nothing about. And what's fun about this museum is, um, you know, it's, these, are, these are Ariane Space engines and I am just really not familiar with them. So I'm, again, excited to read your guys' comments, helping correct me and, and help me learn about this particular engine. But for me, it's just kind of a fun thought experiment to just go through these raw without any real knowledge and just try to observe. Um, let's actually do this again because this museum actually has uh, another engine. This one, I'm excited for this one because it actually has a cutaway so we can really look into the engine and try to figure out more things about this engine uh, than we can with this one. So let's come this way. Okay, now it's, it's quite a bit darker here so I'm going to turn on the flashlight and, and take a look at this. Okay, so this is, this is from what, an Ariane 1? And these are Viking 2 engines, yeah. RN1 Viking 2 engines. Now, the first thing, again, I don't know much about this engine at all, so I'm just gonna show you what I can observe. The first thing you notice with this cutaway, look at the throat. There's a few things we can tell. First off, it's not a very narrow throat. So this has a, a not a, it just doesn't have a big expansion ratio. Um, so normally a lot of, uh, you know, rocket throats get really small. This is a huge area for its throat. It's also ablatively cooled. You'll notice it actually has literally what looks like wood and very well might be wood with some kind of additional carbon liner that would ablate. So it's a very primitive way to cool your engine is with uh, ablative cooling. So just, but for this, just the throat appears to be ablatively cooled. But we notice the engine itself is mostly film cooled. You'll see these little holes here inside the manifold or inside the injector. These here provide film cooling. So it's gonna pour additional fuel down the walls of the rocket engine. So that's what's gonna keep this part of the engine from melting. Uh, it also will aid in preventing the throat from melting too fast. But then down here, I don't know what they did. And it's actually really confusing because you can see it, there may have been like a little bit of a, a, a liner of a little bit of carbon liner or something for some ab ablation. Cause it appears to have almost a little bit of a liner. Now don't forget after the throat, it just gets cooler and cooler and cooler. So it's less and less important. But you do notice there's a few lines down here and I'm guessing, I, I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing these are some kind of, uh, you know, readout. There would be some kind of, you know, a pressure sensor or something. I don't think that has anything to do with the regen, but then you have things like this that just really confuse me. What would this be used for? And it might just be literally a brace to keep the, the nozzle from flexing. Um, but I don't know, I'm pretty sure this, you can see normally, you'll notice here the, um, there's actually, since this nozzle's cut out, if this was a regeneratively cooled nozzle, you'd actually see channels down in, kind of like we saw the channels, you know, you can see those lines in the nozzle of the, uh, of the other engine. This has no channels in it at all. So it's literally likely just potentially a little bit ablatively cooled, film cooled, and I don't think radiative cooled because I don't think this is a thin enough metal to, 
to radiate heat out. So it's probably just uh, cool enough and, and thick enough, like heat sink. It's a pretty thick wall. They just hope that it wouldn't melt. So let's take a look at what we can observe from the rest of this engine. Right here, this is a pretty telltale sign that this also is an open cycle engine, gas generator. So I, I don't know why it has two pipes there, but um, this is gonna be the turbine up there. You can see the turbine wheel there. Those are the turbine blades on the left and the right. Uh, but you'll notice in the middle there, that is called the stator. And uh, it's actually kind of flowing in the opposite direction of the turbine blades. So that actually does not rotate. The rest of the, the wheel will spin. And what that stator does is allows the gas, you'll notice the gas is kind of, it's gonna go left to right. So the high pressure uh, gas generator exhaust is gonna flow through that first bit of the turbine blade. It's gonna hit that stator. That stator is gonna flip the exhaust back around and give it another chance to extract more of that energy to be able to use it again. So basically the reason you see the two blades there is so that you have more of an opportunity to spin up and, and extract energy from the gas generator. So then uh, that means that the gas generator has to be on the left side of this turbine. So it's gonna come in left to right. But what's weird about this engine is that that's not the, it has a separate gas generator. You can see that actually, look at, it's cut open right here. It's a separate gas generator right here. This is what's gonna produce the high pressure to spin the pumps. And um, now uh, what's interesting here, so notice, okay, notice the blue pump, different color, that should tell us something. And notice, oh, look up in here, look up in here. There's a toroidal tank. See that separate tank there that is fed to those flexible hoses? So that must mean that's actually a, like a monoprop or another fuel that runs just the gas generator. And so you'll see that is manifolded out. Where does that actually all go? That's really, I don't know what this thing is at all. That's very confusing to me. We'll ignore that for now, but, but you do notice that this one literally comes down from that toroidal tank, goes into the inlet side of this, of this pump, this little boost pump, and that's basically what's going to power this, this gas generator. So this must be a monoprop gas generator because I don't see another, well, I think it's a monoprop. I don't see a catalyst bed in there. Normally with a monoprop engine, you'd see like a catalyst bed. So it might actually mix with something else. It could actually, I'm pretty sure, um, I, think, I think the sign's actually wrong because I think the sign says it's hydrogen. I'm pretty sure this is not a Hydrolox engine um, for a few reasons. Number one, the pump sizes are almost identical. The two, it's a single shaft. So right there, you can almost rule out hydrogen because a hydrogen pump is going to need a much, much bigger, uh, it's going to require a lot more power than your oxidizer, which is why we see the, uh, the engine over there has, has dual shafts. It has a separate gas generator for each of the pumps because the oxygen pump requires a lot less power than the hydrogen pump. So we can tell just by looking at these two and the fact that it is single shaft, that it's not hydrogen. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing, and I'm pretty sure uh, that this is actually uh, a hypergolic engine. Um, but yeah, the, the sign does not say that, so that's confusing. <laughs> um, but anyway, so you'll notice that the single shaft does run to this other pump here, that little blue guy, and that's what actually feeds the gas generator. So there's a chance that, that the that it is a separate monopropellant. And maybe that's actually, I don't know, that's, that's confusing. I wanna learn up on that. And, and again, I'm, I'm excited. I know that there's someone yelling at their computer screen right now, uh, being like, how do you not know that that gas generator, you know? I'm excited to learn from you guys because this is an engine I know nothing about. But I did wanna point out probably one more thing before I stop wasting your time, or maybe two more things. Um, <laughs> you'll notice there's the injector plate up here. Now notice the top of the chamber doesn't have any injectors in it. It's just totally, ple so, so the injectors are coming in from the sides. This is actually pretty uncommon. These days, almost all modern injectors come in from the top of some kind, either with a pintle injector might, you know, c come down from the top and kind of spray up into those areas. But it's unusual to have the whole top of the chamber be just completely left empty um, and have all of the injector faces. So you'll notice there's different sizes, like kind of a, a bigger hole and then two smaller holes so there's gonna be your, your fuel and your oxidizer are gonna come out of opposite uh, sides of those. So I'm trying to figure out, oh, so actually you can kind of see that 
one of them, I, I think the orange pump is oxidizer. Well, I don't, because, let me think about that. Fuel. Red pipe is fuel, which would be this, which would, which would flow, yeah, so that would make sense. Fuel would flow down here. You don't want to use film cooling with, with an oxidizer. You're going to chew through that, you're going to burn through that metal pretty quickly. So that would mean, too, that these channels here, so these little tiny holes, you can see this, this would be filled with your, your fuel. These little itty bitty holes are actually your fuel then. And that bigger hole, or the one next to it, is going to be your oxidizer. So that's, that is strange to me though. The, or am I looking at it wrong? It's really hard to tell from this angle. But they're impinging. You do see the injectors like this are going, spraying in from two different angles. Oh, and right here, it's doing the same thing. So that might actually be the bigger looking hole is because it's an impinging injector, so they're two spraying together, and that spray then goes and fans out. So that's actually exactly what we're seeing. That's really cool. You actually see the impingement, so fuel's gonna flow through here on this end, it's gonna flow through here, and they're gonna meet right there, and they're gonna spray together, and that coming together is gonna make it shoot out and atomize a little bit, and that's going to aid in uh, extra combustion uh, efficiency because you're, it's easier to, it's, when they're atomized, though, the fuel and the oxides will mix together a lot easier. So also that explains why there's no inject or there's no igniter because it's hypergolic. So we don't have any kind of igniter up at the top of the chamber anywhere. Um, when we first walked by this engine, we were speculating on some things and we're trying to figure out, you know, that was one of the things, there's no, no place for the igniter. And that makes sense. If it's hypergolic, it doesn't need an igniter because the fuel and oxidizer will mix and combust right away. And the last thing that I wanted to kind of point out here is you can see that it is a single axis gimbal. So there's only one uh, the gimbal mount only has a unidirectional joint on it, like a hinge. And so this actuator only can move these engines on a single axis. So these two engines here could provide, uh, you know, either yaw or roll, or we'll just say, or not, yaw, yaw or pitch. We'll say these do pitch and those other two would do yaw. But then if they all move opposite of each other, they can provide roll. So that's pretty much all I can kind of point out besides the fact that I'm pretty sure these are maybe the pre-valves, but... I don't really know that the plumbing down here really confuses me, honestly. Like, what does that, I don't, I don't know. Things aren't quite adding up, but maybe that's because it's missing the actual tankage up there besides that toroidal tank, which is really, really cool to see. Very, very Kerbal Space Program-esque to have a, a big toroidal tank like that, and I, I think that's really cool. Uh, full disclosure, we walked away, started trying to read about some of the stuff, because of course we're all just curious. and. Uh, learn something really interesting. The toroidal tank is not a monopropellant. It's actually a water tank. So that's literally just that big steel donut uh, would make Homer Simpson very happy, but also uh, is just literally water. And you'll notice that it feeds down into the, this still goes to that blue pump. The blue pump is for water and it just feeds into the gas generator and it is there to cool off the gas generator because notice that this is, the, this is high pressure fuel here that is going up into the gas generator. There's also a line there, if you trace it from the oxidizer side, so that right up in the, coming out of the, the yellowish, orangish part goes up into the gas generator. So you have your fuel, you have your oxidizer, and again, these are, these are hypergolic. So they're gonna mix there, and then it's going to be, it's, then it has this water line that goes and sprays in there and cools down the, because it's basically the same ratio of fuel and oxidizer as the, what comes out of the pumps. And so they're gonna cool it down before it hits the turbine so it doesn't melt the turbine. So that is a water injection system just to cool down the gas generator exhaust to make it survivable inside the turbine blades here. So these turbines will actually see a good amount of just basically steam and obviously a decent amount of, uh, of the hypergolic mixture. But that's really, really cool and so, that, that solves a lot, of, a lot of things here, that answers a lot of questions. Uh, but it also, it, and I'm, yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm confirmed now, and I've firmed up in my head that this is definitely the, the hydrogen and the yellow is the oxygen. And it's just so cool to see this engine kind of torn apart like this and have that opportunity to, to just look and observe. And, and I did want to point out too, the uh, fun thing that, that I missed when we were talking about it or didn't talk about is how the the fuel pump's gonna come from the tanks right here in the middle, they're gonna meet in the middle, and that's gonna be the fuel tank on the bottom. But notice that the oxygen pump pipes run up the side of the rocket, and each one has four pipes that run on the outside of the rocket up to the oxidizer tanks. 
So the, you would have seen these big four pipes. I'm kind of excited. I really haven't looked at too many pictures of, of, uh, of this rocket. So I'm, I'm excited to see that and, and observe the pipes on the outside of the vehicle. So there you go. That's, uh, that's the, uh, the Viking two engine from the Ariane one. Really, really cool. So hopefully you guys learned something. I, uh, hopefully what you did learn from me is at least somewhat correct. If you want to support the work I do, head on over to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. And while you're online, be sure and check out our amazing Falcon 9 model rockets. We also have tons of other fun, cool stuff like shirts and our dress wear or even socks or other fun accessories at everydayastronaut.com slash shop. But uh, that's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people.